He worked at other things, and they discovered he had a gravel pit in his yard. <laughs> he was sitting right there, down there, on a 60-foot gravel pit where they had hauled it out and made quite a little bit of money off of it without even farming. But he lived to be 92, and he was still farming, growing tomatoes and selling them on the road in his shorts when he died. And Dad had died quite suddenly on their 50, 45th anniversary, he told Mom. I have a picture of them. You've seen that picture, the kissing picture. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, Mama, we're going to make 50. Two weeks later, didn't make it. So it was bad. It, it was bad on Mom, too, because Uncle was there and uh, helped her through it, I guess. And I guess one of the hardest things you asked me that I ever had to do was when I had, we had spent the night and helped them do some things on the farm and then went to church on Mother's Day, year before Dad died. Mr. Engel met us at church and he said, Margie, you're gonna have to go tell your mother that Tony died. And so we left our kids with Bunny's sister at church and went back to the farm, but I, I guess that's about as hard a thing as I ever had to do. And so Mike Kaiser came and told me that, that Dad had died. He didn't quite know where to go, and the men were out fishing. And he didn't want to come up here to tell me by himself, but he did. And of all days in the world, I never w did have a headache or was sick, but I, for some reason, I, I laid back down that morning. I just didn't feel real good. And uh, so he went down and tried to find Bunny so he could go out there with me. But that was a bad one. So I guess everybody has to give bad news sometimes. But when you have to bury your child, it's real hard. Sure. And then the grandkids started coming. There's. I'm going to start kids with my oldest sister, Ethel, that I thought she was a very, very pretty girl. And she was 16 when I was born. Maybe I told this before. But, um,. I loved her very much, and she loved me, and she stayed at the house after she and Heine got married. I think I told you this about uh, when I told Mother that I would never get married. I would never leave. I was going to get married. Okay. She got back from Miami. Then in a few months, she had a baby named Irene. Got through Irene. I think I had Irene in school already. And... Uh, she and Dorothy were in the same. I got Dorothy born, didn't I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she uh, knocked on the school teacher's room, and it was Murtis, who was uh, Dorothy's sister-in-law. And she knocked, and she says, um, Miss Hermit, she said, I'd like to speak to my aunt. And uh, she said, You would, honey? Well, where is your aunt? She said, Right over there in that chair. And it was Dorothy. So she gave the message and she said she left. She couldn't keep a straight face about it. But they had secrets and they had to tell them. So then, um, let's see what Murtis did next. Well, she talked quite a few little years with it, stayed with the lady next to the school before she married Jim. And at the wedding, uh, I was already married and had Lil. And her mom nursed the baby all the evening so I could dance. We had the dance, and they got married the 19th of March with orange blossoms. And they were so sweet smelling. And it's strange because uh, there were orange blossoms in another wedding. And that they were also married on the 19th of March, and that was Ethel and Heine. Because we had homemade bouquets, and they went to Pensacola and got married. And... Uh, courthouse 
and took pictures. Of course, at that time they still had some oranges and satsumas, not a whole bunch. But Ethel used to, she, she uh, dressed up, they used to dress up for Mardi Gras. Not Mardi Gras, we didn't have Mardi Gras. We had just uh, masquerade dances. And Ethel da dressed up as the Statue of Liberty. And Elizabeth would always dress and whatever. She had many, many costumes. One was, uh, she was an Indian girl, and one she was a, a Hawaiian girl, and when she was, um, oh dear, oh, she and Tony, her brother, dressed up, and he was Rudolph Valentino, and she was a floozy with a short dress, and uh, they, uh, she and Joe did the Charleston. Now Tony was more of a smooth dancer, and uh, but Joe dressed up too, and he was with his golf and pants and a cap. And they went to Lillian and won the Charleston contest one night. So I'd let Elizabeth would let me come in her room and help curl her hair. She, I'd put that curling iron over the lamp chimney and hold it till it got just the right. She said she thought that was right. And I would hand it to her and she'd curl it up and hold it. And I asked her what she'd doing that for. And she said, those are my mischief curls. So, and she was just so pretty. And they had both been in beauty contests. And uh, didn't either one of them win, I don't think. Well, I was in a beauty contest, too, one time in uh, high school. And uh, I had loaned my only dress to uh, Hetty Biddle. And she was down here just last week and had dinner with me. And we had a, a lot of laughs over what we did. But we didn't mention this party. But it was in Foley High School. And so... I borrowed Eleanor Kaiser's dress that was much prettier than mine, uh, but admission was 25 cents, and you could vote on the woman of your choice or the beauty of your choice, and uh, the reason that I was in it was because there was they needed money for the school, and the sponsor paid five dollars, and so the principal came in, and Mr. Fraley, and he said, and why aren't you enrolled in this beauty contest, and I said, uh, I just didn't want to, and I loaned my dress out. Well, can't you get another one? I, I said, well, I think I might, but uh, I really didn't want to. Well, we need you. So that night, we went to the beauty contest. My brothers took me, Julius and Charlie. And it got out in the middle of the stage when it got my time, and there was this old uh, violin orchestra from uh, Silver Hill, uh, Mr. Lundberg, and he had a band. And it, he was not real peppy. It was just kind of old grinding music. But what he was p playing that night was the tune was new. It was a little bit independent. And he was singing, you know, somebody was singing, A little bit independent when she walks. A little bit independent when she talks. And it got right square in the middle of the stage making my pirouette. And the orchestra changed tunes. <laughs> so... I just kept swinging and walking off of the stage. <laughs> that was my interest. And we got home, my brother said, says you would have sure won if Oscar hadn't run out of quarters. <laughs> he was a poor country boy, too. But uh, I guess he put in a quarter for me, too. Because they passed the plate around, and then you put, they had a sheet, and you had, they had to mark who they were for and put their quarter in. But those were just one of the silly few things that we did at school. Uh, didn't go to high school, but uh, until about a fourth way through the uh, 11th grade. But when we got to Foley, it was a new world. We just, uh, there were just so many city people and there were 50 kids in my room, my class. So, um, that was the first time we split up into two classes, and I didn't get my diploma until Lil was a senior, and I went took a GED with a friend of mine. Is that you or me? And uh, I 
let me see what did I do oh then uh, a few years later in 19 well, I hadn't we hadn't done that yet but anyway I was interested in Foley High School and the class of 39 would have been the class so there was an article in the paper for which I was writing already the onlooker and it said class of 39 largest ever to graduate so I was thinking about all those kids that I'd known in school so I said you know we ought to do something about that if it was the first biggest class that there was graduated and it was wartime so I called a couple of them they said we'll call this one call that one and it did and we got a meeting going and had it all figured out how we were going to have it where we were going to have it 40 years and I'm not sure if that was the one that one of the hurricanes had come in and uh, we thought we'd go down to Holiday Inn and have it, it was brand new well Holiday Inn got washed up so we were out of a place to have it so we went up to Malbus and it was um, quite a drive for everybody to go and there was going to be quite a bunch and this one lady said she thought it would be big enough and so she said well come let's go up there on a Sunday afternoon so Bunny and I went with two more couples and I, when I went in the bathroom I came out and I said I've got I can do better than this because they had an old pink colored tile in the bathroom that old old fashioned kind and it had black mold and all the cracks and <laughs> And then there wouldn't have been room for the little band that we wanted. And so they said, where? And I said, we're right in Foley. Where? I said, we've got a new church hall. And uh, we can have it there. So they were real pleased with the facilities. And we had it. Then at 50 years, we had another one. And... Uh, half a dozen of the kids had died b between that time but school was fun to me and there were one or two girls that said they just would never go because it was the worst time of their lives just miserable and they played all the ball games were in the daytime because we didn't have electricity or very poor electricity the field wasn't lighted so we'd school bus would wait and we'd go home after we'd turn school out at, right after lunch and go into the ball game had a pretty good team but Robertsdale was a killer they they never were kind to us and Bayman it wasn't kind we had some girls and I never heard such talk though I could swear but they would come and they'd do the cheerleading and I, we had a an Episcopal priest named Tom Byrne that would come to every afternoon game. He lived in the old Foley home while he preached in Foley. And these girls would say, give them a holler, give them a yell, Foley, Foley, go to hell. Just real brazen like it. He'd go down and talk to them, you know. And I learned about cheerleading. I never was one. I talked to Ina the other day and she said she, she was always one. And, and Lona was too and she said but I was always the tree and they all stood up on me because I was <laughs> I was the biggest <laughs> and I laughed about that but they loved the cheerleading things and the kids still love it today so then I'm going to go back to the next kid that came along I didn't even tell you that I had three Lillian who was born at home and I thought I was having gas pains <laughs> went outside because there was still an outside toilet and I sat there and tried to have this gas pain and it <laughs> I finally staggered into the house and uh, pretty soon I got in pain and the doctor came on home that night and I mean came down and by daylight I I had a little girl baby it was six weeks early and they didn't look at her real good. The doctor examined her, but she had a cleft palate, and we just wondered why in the world she couldn't nurse and why she cried a lot. And then Grandma 
bundled her up and took her out to the doctor and she said something is wrong with this child and we couldn't figure what it was and he said why well, she can't nurse one of my neighbors came over and they had a lot of milk and she would just give her spoons full at a time uh, that she'd milk from herself and let the baby nurse her but it was pretty pretty what I should say scary I guess and another thing, Grandma had a big old cat. She had two or three of them. Christine's going to like this. And that cat would come in the house, and Grandma would feed them, even out of her dishes, you know, she, they could eat. Well, then when she washed dishes, it, you wash them in a hot, sudsy dish pan that sat on the counter on the cabinet because it didn't have a sink. And then she would take a kettle of boiling water and scald and just real like Aunt Minnie did when she came so one night I went in one day from Washington and that cat was up on her crib and it scared me so bad I, I he smelled the milk on and I had heard this wife's old wives tale about a cat taking the baby's breath but he was after that milk did you ever hear that Ann? Sure. Sure. I don't know how many of my family were very upset with me because when Jimmy was a baby, we had a cat, and the cat would climb through the crib bars and sleep there with him. Mm. I never thought about it. I thought, mm. But then they said that they would do yeah, that. I heard that thing too, but I thought. Well, I was scared. I never did like that cat, and I was glad when he died. He weighed 17 pounds. Oh, wow. Now, this, this, this was floppy. She was a good Well, cat. this one was fluffy too. Stupid cat would crawl through the, the playpen wood bars, and Jimmy would grab a hold of it, and the cat would go, Arr! but she never scratched that child. Good child. Good genes. Good cat. Well, then, uh, let's see, Lil. We had to take her to Mobile to have uh, surgery when she was 15 months old. Uh, the doctor said she had to have a cleft palate surgery, but nobody had done one. But there was one doctor in Mobile, and we went through the Crippled Children's Foundation, and uh, they were going to help us. The doctor fixed it so that that we could get um, surgery with help. And uh, there was another doctor that worked with him that had had a child this the year before who had a cleft palate as well. And he went to St. Louis where they were perfecting this cleft palate surgery. And he's the one who did it. He was a Dr. Fondy. And she had to stay in the hospital two weeks with those packing in her. And they wouldn't let me stay with her night. She was in the children's ward. And I would go every day, uh, stay with Aunt Vivian and Uncle Jim. And I would, uh, that was Steiner's in Mobile. I would go down and hold my baby in the daytime. While she's in the hospital, this, this girl just loved her. There was a kind of chunky little girl that had something pretty bad wrong with her and she went to hold the baby and Lil got head lice and so they got no it wasn't I'll take it back it was bed bugs she got bed bugs and uh we overed that hurdle and then Joy was born and when she came into the world it was three years later at home I was going to go to the hospital and uh, kids around the neighborhood had measles, and I had measles. And uh, Bunny went and told Miss Holmes I would be coming out to the hospital, and she said, no, you won't. <laughs> I'll come down and deliver that baby, because the doctor had gone in the service. He was in Hawaii, mm -hmm. somewhere on a ship. So would you believe the joy was a breach? And it wasn't funny. And I was going to be brave, brave. And so we had a kerosene lamp, and Grandma was holding it, and then put the lamp down, and another neighbor came in. Marguerite was helping. And I didn't know to breathe the chloroform. They gave you chloroform, and I was trying to eat it. Man, I was going, <gasps> <laughs> and it wasn't doing anything, and they wondered why in the world. But uh, 
after a while, after turning to two or three Somersets, and I'll go ahead and tell this on Joy, because uh, she probably won't watch this, but the lady that was going to come take care of me then uh, was over here from Mobile, and she saw Joy being born, and she said, oh my God, she said, the poor little thing's head is busted open. <laughs> and, of course, I heard that, and <coughs> then they described her being a breach. I didn't know what breach was, but I know now. <laughs> so her head busted open was her bottom. Yes. <coughs> <coughs> so we had a lot of laughs about that since then. <laughs> oh, sorry, Joy, but that's... Arm, arm, <coughs> arm and a leg, and they kept trying to turn him. Yeah. Brian, they had to do a C-section. I knew you had a bad trouble with that. Yeah, that's why I think Brian was always Mama's favorite, because uh, they said, you know, we're going to have to do this C-section, and I said, can I see my husband and my mother? And all I thought, you know, and it wasn't what should have more faith, I thought, if I die, I hope the baby goes with me, because my mother's going to be stuck with him, and that's enough. So, anyway, I, everybody survived, and then two <coughs> years later, in March, Mary Beth arrived, so I had prepared myself to go to the hospital again, because I wanted to go somewhere. <laughs> we didn't get to go anywhere down here. So when, uh, when uh, the time came, March the 14th, uh, I was sitting on the floor covering a pretty little mattress to go in the crib that Grandpa had made Bunny years back. I think he made it for maybe Pete, his other, or Eleanor, but Grandpa made this little crib and we borrowed it. And I was covering it so it would be pretty and uh, all of a sudden I had some pains that just didn't sound and feel right. So a neighbor, Marguerite, got looking and she said it was time to call the doctor because I had had the mumps. <laughs> no, you can't come out here. And they had another doctor, Dr. McKinnon, because Bunny was, I mean, the doctor was still in the service. World War One, two, of course, not one. So, um, but by the time they got me, didn't even get me prepped doctor went in the kitchen to have a cup of coffee with the father and the grandfather and some little old kid started crying. <laughs> Mary Beth was born, they hollered for the doctor to hurry and he did. She, everything was fine and she never had the mumps. They, the doctor said she'll never have the mumps. So, so far she hadn't and she's 60 mom. years old. Well, so. But poor darling Grandpa got them, Bunny's dad. Mm. He suffered pretty bad with them. <laughs> so we got them coming along. Everything was good. And uh, two years later, I'd had some problems with my um, female organs and didn't know just what, but I was pregnant again in uh, about six months. I miscarried and we lost our I did get to go to the hospital that time but the baby was still born a little boy so we got over that one and came home and we started you know living again but Bunny had bought me a pretty red geranium and I put it in the window in the sunshine and uh Mary Beth climbed up on a bed. She was just about the size of Stephen, little Stephen. And she she took that geranium and she must have torn it in dirt and all in about a dozen pieces. <laughs> she was a farmer even then, see, at age two. So then they all got happily married. Of course, you all know this about yourself, so I won't tell any more. I'll tell some more about your other aunts and uncles. Um, I've only mentioned what down to Elizabeth, down to 
And I can remember when Elizabeth would sing that uh, Ramona, that song that was so pretty. And in late afternoon, she would sing, Ramona, does Mission Bill can hear you call? La, la, la. <laughs> I thought she was sent from heaven. And uh, she was. By the kids said all babies were. Then she went to Detroit. First she went to Ohio. And one of the things she did that was kind of, she liked, she went to Mass and she said she didn't have dollars to put in like uh, people were putting in dollars, but they had these envelopes on the seat for everybody. And she said, I got an envelope and I put 35 cents in it and sealed it up. And nobody knew what I put, I put in. And she got a, a green coat with a beautiful fox collar. And I thought, and she had a cloche hat and sent a picture of her in that. I'd show that to everybody. I thought she was so pretty. Mm -hmm. And then she uh, came back home and was working at Paradise Beach, babysitting. And, and my brother-in-law was bringing furniture down for the Paradise Beach Hotel from his Uncle Phil's factory. And, Sadowski, and this cute little Polak man, he kind of, he liked her, so he'd he'd bring the furniture down, and leave the packing crates roll on this big truck that that poor kid wasn't even 21, I don't think, was driving that big truck down here, alone. I think he was alone, and uh, when the when the truck went back to Michigan, guess what was on the back in those packing crates? Moonshine whiskey, because oh. <laughs> it was it was a uh, prohibition all over the country. So that made several trips, and he never did know that. But anyway, then they fell in love, and they got married up there. A beautiful picture, beautiful bride. We were proud of that. Then Joe. I guess I should have mentioned Joe first, because he was a dreamer. He loved, his, he had a saxophone, and he'd play that saxophone. He wasn't much of a farmer, I don't think. But the dogs would howl when he'd play that saxophone in the evenings. And, and when he married Josephine, um, he went up there to Michigan because he'd met her when the Shambos came to Lillian to start an ice cream parlor. and as an entrepreneur and it was before the it was during the 26 hurricane and that hotel was doing real good and these land uh, salesmen were staying in the hotel and Mrs. Shambo was cooking for them and one day she had made these two lemon pies for dessert Josephine and her family were living in this old house nearby and so she sent little Josephine, 15 years old, across the foot log to um, deliver the pies for dinner. And she said it black, when she went to step over, a black snake ran out from under that log and she clapped those pies together. <laughs> together. And the next thing she knew, 